Hello again from Metro Manila, the Philippines, Southeastern Asia. For some or several years, I have pondered the views on slavery, specifically southern slavery, in other words, in the southern region of the United States. Put forward in a monograph called Southern Slavery as it was, uh, co-authored by Doug or Douglas Wilson, who is an American uh, reformed pastor. based in Moscow, Idaho. I myself have some years ago read it. It's probably still available online. So he co-authored this controversial book with League of the South co-founder Steve Wilkins. And he then followed it up with a book called Black and Tan, uh, published in 2004, possibly. And his point essentially was that uh, despite its evils, overall the system of slavery in the southern region of the United States that ended then in the bloody civil war, or through the bloody civil war in the early 1860s, was a relatively benign system there were many good parts to it. And uh, I'm quoting, slavery produced in the South a genuine affection between the races that we believe we can say has never existed in any nation before the war, meaning the US Civil War or since. Obviously, many historians were critical of the book and even many uh, fellow professing Christians, including uh, fellow reformed Christians were critical of the book. There is one uh, African-American reformed uh, Christian theologian who in, on his website condemned um, pastor or Reverend Wilson's views. Such historians as Peter H. Wood, Claiborne, Carson and Ira Berlin condemned the pamphlet's arguments with Wood calling them as spurious as Holocaust denial. <clears throat> Several years ago Reverend Wilson was interviewed uh, for his Ask Doug program and the interview was uploaded on YouTube on Southern Slavery and he strongly denied rumors that he's actually a racist or a proponent of slavery and uh, he said that it's a good riddance that slavery is gone but he argued that if it had uh, vanished in a godly way it would have uh, vanished through a Christian revival. It is easy for him to say this with a hindsight of one and a half centuries since uh, slavery officially ended. It's easy for him to say this as a person of essentially European origin, as a white person, someone who has never outwardly been enslaved. As um, Abraham Lincoln, the president who signed the Emancipation Proclamation <coughs> in 1862, it was then published in 1863, said uh, that the people who favor slavery should have it tried on themselves. Yes. He claimed that he sought the restoration of an ideal era or time period in the past where faith and reason seemed at one and when family, church and the organic community of Christians that the American British writer T.S. Eliot described in Christianity and culture were more powerful than the state. The Southern Poverty Law Center connected Wilson's views to the neo-Confederate and Christian Reconstruction movements influenced by R.J. Rushduni concluding <coughs> Wilson's theology is in many ways indistinguishable from basic tenets of Reconstruction. Canon Press seized publication of Southern Slavery as it was, and rightly so, when it became aware of serious citation errors in several passages authored by Wilkins. Robert Mackenzie, the history professor who first noticed the citation problems, described the authors as being sloppy rather than malevolent. <clears throat> 
Wilson then reworked and redacted the arguments in the tract and published without Wilkins a new set of essays under the name Black and Tan after consulting with his historian Eugene Genovese. And then he addressed his views on slavery, racism, and states' rights in a 2011 interview by Canon Wired. Maybe that was the interview to which I referred. So it is easy for us to get into overgeneralizations one way or the other. During the Great Depression and New Deal time of 1930s, former slaves were interviewed and according to one of the websites I consulted when I was searching for Reverend Wilson's views, um, it was found that the kinds of que answers that these former slaves who were still living, uh, who of course were at the very least in their 80s in order to be uh, able to recall what it meant like to live under slavery, they varied that they probably gave more honest <clears throat> interviews to fellow African Americans than to white Americans. And therefore these interviews alone should not be cited as a sufficiently reliable guide. And then as for the genuine affection between races, it is a well-known and very sad and even shameful fact that a significant number of white slave owners either raped or sexually molested or at least harassed female slaves, usually young women or girls. There are even allegations according to which uh, Thomas Jefferson, the third president of the United States, who himself was a slave owner, could have um, had an extramarital affair with one of his uh, female slaves but we'll leave that aside. So, while the Bible does not explicitly condemn slavery, it is by no means unbiblical to oppose a system where essentially uh, there are two classes of human beings. One are outwardly free, one are slaves, and the difference is not righteous living uh, by one group or unrighteous living by another group, but in skin color or ethnicity, the accident of birth, none of us has chosen his or her nationality or so-called race. None of us has chosen his or her parents. None of us has chosen his or her um, city or town, province, state or country, or even continent of birth. None of us. And therefore those should not be used as guidelines of dividing a people into a system of more or less uh, structured inequality. And if slavery had been such a benign system, why then did so many slaves, especially starting in the early 19th century, either successfully or unsuccessfully escape from slavery? Why were there people who, like Harriet Beecher Stowe, uh, through their writings, in her case the book uh, Uncle Tom's Cabin, protested against the inhumane aspects of slavery? Why was there a strong abolitionist movement in the United States, especially by the 1850s? And why did such pragmatic politicians as Abraham Lincoln, who by no means could be considered or could have been considered even back then as a believer in racial equality, nevertheless oppose slavery? Well, because slavery was, despite those positive exceptions that, yes, existed. Nevertheless, a wicked system, um, a radically unfair system where one so-called race was enslaving members of another so-called race, and where basically uh, the African-American slaves were taught to accept their, their fate, even to accept cruel treatment, and even 
uh, to claim that this was God's will for them for generations to come in extreme cases. And even those uh, unbiblical doctrines according to which the African Americans were actually of Cain's uh, seed or like inferior subhumans, well, shades of the Holocaust, where Jews were subjected to horrible tortures and uh, executions, including those famous or infamous gas chambers, and some six million of them were killed. Um, and then Abraham Lincoln himself declared in his second and last inaugural address just weeks before he was killed in March 1865 uh, that possibly slavery was one of those offenses that they that needed to come but woe to those people by whom they would come um, nevertheless um, we have to have to see just like the recently or admit just like the recently deceased American historian Mrs. and Dr. Willie Lee Rose that slavery was not a static system that it involved and yes it was true that especially as the total abolition of slavery drew near gradually more slave owners especially those who were humane and deeply committed Christians were releasing their slaves quite a typical time for them to do so was shortly before they died and then it was possible for some uh, industrious slaves to eventually buy their freedom to become freed men uh, as the term was called and yes it is true that the treatment of slaves differed radically uh, at its most benign level uh, it was a system where they were only technically slaves. In fact, they were loved as equals, and they were like uh, well-respected and honored and beloved servants to their masters. At their worst, they were treated brutally, or even more brutally than cattle. And then, let's cite some facts. Those female slaves uh, who were young enough to give birth were supposed to be kept pregnant, producing more slaves to sell. And then the variations in skin color found in the United States among the people who are classified as African Americans, uh, some of them are actually brown in skin color rather than black of course make it obvious how often black females were impregnated by white men already in the 1850 census 75.4 uh, percent or about three quarters of free negroes in florida were described as mulattoes that is descendants of blacks and whites um, and then light-skinned young girls were sold openly for sexual use. Their price was much higher than that of a field hand or servant. <clears throat> and then, of course, whipping or scourging was a typical punishment for slaves. And in one well-publicized photograph, a black, uh, maybe freed male slave is shown uh, with his back in a terrible condition as a result of beatings. So in the 19th century, proponents of slavery often defended the institution as a necessary evil and claimed that the, if the blacks were freed, they would not be able to live as decent citizens. They had to be kept in charge, much like the South African white apartheid defenders defended that system that the blacks of south africa or as they were racistly called the kafirs needed to be who ruled by this white heron folk or master race <clears throat> 
and even such an admirer of the early U.S. Republic. The French writer and traveler Alexis de Tocqueville in his influential La Démocratie en Amérique, or Democracy in America, published in 1835, expressed opposition to slavery while observing its effects on American society. Even he felt that a multiracial society without slavery was untenable. And uh, none other than Lincoln himself thought as one of the solutions to this racial problem that uh, African Americans would be encouraged to emigrate to Africa. And uh, some freed African American slaves emigrated to what is now called, known as Liberia already in the 1830s, and Liberia still exists. Um, and as Lincoln himself declared in his second inaugural address in 1865, one-eighth of the U.S. population, so something like 12-13% were African-American slaves and they were concentrated heavily of course in the South. It is true that by no means all white Southerners owned slaves. Uh, the truly elite slave owning class who had over 50 or even over 100 slaves was truly small but that uh, class had an enormous political and economic influence and social influence. And no wonder that so many African American slaves escaped, and if they were lucky, they were able to go into those free states of northern United States that had already abolished slavery. Some even migrated, or a few even migrated north into what is now known as Canada. Yes, Peter of Gordon, Peter or Gordon, a whipped slave, was photographed in Baton Rouge, Louisiana in 1863, and he showed uh, how brutally he had been whipped in his back. The guilty overseer was then fired. And basically, the slaves were hired to do the kinds of menial jobs, especially on the cotton fields and other uh, places of those uh, large southern farms or plantations that the whites would refuse to do. And there, then there were those uh, slave rebellions and quite many of them in the first half of the 19th century. If the system had truly been as benign as, for example, such early 21st centuries apologists for the system as Reverend Wilson seemed to think or seemed to have thought, then these would have been totally useless. And it was particularly wicked that many slaves were denied the right to learn how to read and write. Although, yes, it is true that some slave owners did uh, patiently teach and even lovingly teach their slaves to read and write. So these are my views. You can of course disagree with them if you want to, but I definitely do not believe that the southern slavery was a good system, even though some of its practitioners were even good Christians. We should not overgeneralize the benevolence of some to mean that most or virtually all uh, slave owners were benign towards their slaves, because that clearly was not the case. Bye-bye, and have a nice remainder of this Northern Hemisphere summer, and God bless.